All right, so so the debate rages on what kind, what is the best kind of area element for us to use when we're trying to add up areas under curves? And we had looked at a couple different options yesterday, and uh, we began sort of an interesting debate about you know what what's what's best here. Do we want to do something that's really simple to calculate for the area, uh, but may not be quite as accurate? Or do we want to do something that's much more accurate, but is also a much harder calculation? And I, I, I kind of just started to mention that this is this is the kind of thing that people do when they write software. Uh, when you when you use a graphing calculator, for example, or if you use a computer algebra system, something that's a much more you know heavyweight application. Uh, the one, you know, we don't really have as much access to that, but in college, where there's more money to spend on that stuff, you'll have that's what you'll be using a lot of. Probably you'll use either Maple, which is a Canadian software that's that does it, it's amazing. And then the one that's the first one uh, is, was is called uh, Mathematica. That's probably the biggest. That ad actually was designed by a guy who was a year ahead of me at Stanford. He was doing that for the first time as an undergraduate project when I was in college. Um, but now it's I mean it's blossomed. You might say he's made a little money off that. Um, but it's Mathematica is in Maple, and there's MathCAD and some other ones too. And there's actually starting to be some open source, cheaper options available too. There, there is one that I, I'd really like to give you some exposure to this, and there, there, I may have an opportunity to do that with a kind of a free one that I'm sort of working with a little bit. Um, not that I'm building, but that I, I'm peripherally working with. Uh, maybe towards the end of the year, if I can get this thing going, I'd like to have you have a chance to come in and, and mess with that a little bit. It, it's it's equivalent to the the TI eighty nine, and I think I this do I simply have a TI eighty nine in here? A couple TI eighty nine. TI eighty nines are remarkable little creatures. They uh, they do some things that are, and, and at some point when we start getting, I, I kind of want to get through a couple sections in, in chapter four, when once we get into this new trick, then you'll really appreciate some of the things that these calculators can do. They're, I don't know in high school that they're necessary. I, I used to really recommend it, and that's all we really used. But everybody in my calculus classes and the things, well, that's what everybody had in the 89s. Uh, but the downside of them is you can't use them on SATs. Is that right? You can't use them on folks tests. Can't use them. There's a lot of tests you can't use them on. So you'd have to kind of be, you know, sort of in the calculator sense, sort of bilingual with your calculator usage. But, but what these things do, that a computer algebra system does that's so remarkable is they don't just do stuff numerically. Like we're used to calculators doing things. You plug in some numbers and you do some calculation, and the calculations can be massive and intense. Uh, but but the computer algebra systems, they will actually do this stuff symbolically. So you could put in one or more variables and ask them to do calculations in terms of the variables, and they will do amazing stuff. Like, for example, if you ask it to multiply out a function with a bunch of variables in it, it will do that. And then it will give you an answer that is simplified in terms of those variables. You can do calculus with variables. You can ask it to do, for example, calculate slopes involving not just numbers, but, but functions. And it will come up with, it will do derivatives, for example. I can put in the derivative of some complicated uh, you know, function, and it's going to it's going to execute all those calculus operations and do all the derivative operations and come up with the actual function that is the answer. So, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, as you might guess, there's a lot it, when, you're, when you're using a calculator like that. It's not so much software as firmware. A lot of that's built into the into the design of the of the physical chips in the calculator. But uh, how do they make it do that? Well, there's there's some issues you have to deal with, especially with the with the calculator where they're not. I mean, these aren't big time processors. They're pretty wimpy, you know, they're, but, but they do very efficient algorithms. <coughs> and so they've got to fight this battle. They've got to do a lot of, of, of interesting uh, testing kind of at a circuit level as to what, what's going what's gonna to be the most efficient way of, of, of doing stuff just like this. This is a very small level example of the kinds of things that software engineers and, and computer engineers do. This is an interesting topic for me. Actually, before I taught, I was an electrical engineer for a while, and I worked for a company doing some kind of research-oriented stuff where we actually were quite
quite heavily in this apartment or in this area. We, we, we provided really expensive tools for companies like Intel to go in and do small scale analysis, like nanoscale analysis of the chips they're building. So they could mill away the layers of passivation and, and put these little tiny, you know, kind of build the chips, the prototype chips. You can imagine how hard that would be because the scales are so small in these things. But the goal was to build the chip that, that would do this kind of stuff so the, the lengths of the wires and the distance between the circuit elements was just right so it could do these really uh, quick, efficient calculations like this. That's what chips do. There's a, there's a give and take. You have to, like I say, there's, there's, there's all kinds of battles you fight on when you're doing chip uh, construction and design like this. That if, if you have the, the, the processes be too intense and it requires too much processing power to do each individual calculation, then the chip gets too hot and you have to worry about how to dissipate the heat, and that's a real issue. Uh, you also, but you, you want to have, you don't want to have um, too many cycles going at once because then you've got, then you have to run the clock speed too high. And so there's, you know, there's, there, there's all kinds of issues going on that, that you fight this balance, you know. And so this is a very real, I, I wish we had more time to kind of spend on just some of these peripheral topics. Because I think some of you guys, I, I mean, I would encourage you to sort of, oh, if you get a chance, I mean, just look into this stuff a little bit. And, you know, read read some, I, I, you guys should all read science. I mean, you're smart people. It's there's stuff on there. Some things that you'll find that, at this level, you can understand that that provide some really interesting topics related to the stuff that you're starting to learn in physics and calculus and advanced biology and advanced chemistry. And it's 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 kind of you know it's food for thought as you start to look at potential careers. But this is really an interesting topic. What do you do? Well, we kind of came to sort of a you know at least knock some things out of, out of consideration. Probably we decided, didn't we, well, I mean, I'm just summarizing, you tell me if I'm wrong, that we didn't want to make things that were too complicated, right? That had like uh, quadratically curved tops, and that's already sounded pretty difficult, and it is, right? We don't want to do things that are too simple either, though, right? We didn't want to do something like try to break this whole thing up into a single shape. We obviously want to cut it into a bunch of little shapes. We sort of got it down maybe to, to trapezoids, those are pretty easy to calculate, right? If you look at the area formula for a trapezoid, remember what it is? It's right. Well, it, let me let me draw a trapezoid. Okay, let's let's take a look at a trapezoid here. And you can, if I draw the trapezoid, you'll be able to tell me what it is. So, I'm going to put my trapezoid sideways because ours are sideways. If we call that base one and that base two, so base one minus and base two. Okay, yeah, and, and see, see if you can come up with a little geometry trick for morphing this into an easier shape. And that's a great trick in oh, calculus, okay. especially. Is there a way I could kind of cut and paste and do okay, things well, to make this into an easier shape? Ah, okay, good. So what what if I are you saying this? What if I took what if I took this guy like right there? I made that cut and I pivoted that piece around. Everybody see that? That'd be a good choice, wouldn't it? Because then I end up with a, with a rectangle, which is the easiest possible area to calculate. Now, what would the height be if I did that? B, B1 is this whole distance. B2 is that whole distance. And this is a linear, that's a line, right? So the slope is constant. Oh, okay, it's the average, isn't it? Right, it's the average of the two. Because the amount that I reduced this base's length is precisely the amount that I increased this base's length. Agreed? Okay. And they end up with the same values. So it's got to be an average. So then this rectangle I created would have a height of B1 plus B2 over 2. Right? And then what's the other dimension of that rectangle? We called it H because usually it's the height. Usually we have the bases. The way I describe it in geometry is you sit it on a coffee table, right? You set the bases on a coffee table, and how high it is above the coffee table is the height. You get the idea. Usually, we call that the height. So there's our formula. Usually, we say, I think in the books, they say 1 half height times B1 plus B2, but I don't remember. I mean, that's as good as any, right? 
So there's the area of a trapezoid. And of course, the area of a rectangle is just, is just you know, width times length or base times height, whatever you want to call it, right? So those are both not too bad. How about if we just play around and explore this a little bit? Let's just take advantage of a couple little applets, little small computer programs. Let's just mess around with this. And you guys can kind of come up with, oh, no, we got going. We can choose what kind of area element we want here. And we can even do something else that's, that's kind of slick. Uh, let me remind you about something that we looked at yesterday. And it was, things were rushed a little bit yesterday. But among other things, we talked about the original trick for calculating the area of a circle, right? And where's that picture? Oh, maybe, OK, the picture was. But, but we looked at two examples. We looked at, I don't think I have it on this one. The two examples we looked at were if we took a polygon and we blew it up from the inside, right? So we had our circle. And then we took some polygon that was, that was you know, we, we blew it up from the inside like so until it pushed out. It's a pretty bad polygon. You get the oh, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Pushed it out until it bumped into the circle. We called that a what? Do you remember? Uh, inscribed. inscribed polygon. Inscribed meaning it's inside. And then the other one we looked at was one that was, we, that was started off too big, and then we deflated it. It's a horrible polygon, but you get the idea. Until it shrunk down, until it bumped into the circle. What do we call that? Circumscribed. Circumscribed. Okay. And so those are our math words for contained and containing. And we're going to do the same kind of thing with our with our new little trick here. Let's first look at. Now, what do I do with it? Oh, there it is. No. There it is. Okay. Do the same thing. We can try rectangles and trapezoids, and we can do examples that are inscribed and circumscribed. Okay. First of all, let, let's take a look at how about if we look at trapezoids? Okay, so if we look at trapezoids, and I want to I'm gonna make the I'm gonna make the number of trapezoids. I get rid of that, I think. No, I can't get rid of that. Let's let the number of trapezoids. If I let the number of trapezoids be one, it's not very good, is it? Right? A single trapezoid isn't terrible for this particular shape, but it's not bad. If I let the number of trapezoids go up, there's two. Does everybody see that? We've got two trapezoids. It'd be kind of nice if they had these things drawn so you could see the edges, but there's there's this is the number of them that we're using, right? Okay. And they're they're split, so there's one, and there's one. I wonder if I can show the edges on that. Do I have that choice? Probably not. But beggars can't be choosers. And I, I could probably find a better one, but I don't want to waste time doing it right now. If I can find them, I'll link to them on the, on the calculus Moodle site. Uh, pretty quickly, those trapezoids start to look darn good, right? Okay, but the area formula is a little harder for those, right? A little bit. Okay. Let's try and look at the areas we're starting to get. When we get n equals 5, look at the bottom down. Can everybody see that? We got 2.64749. We're starting to approach some value, aren't we? Yeah. Maybe you want to take a guess what maybe that is? There's n equals 6, n equals 7, n equals 8, n equals 9. It looks like it's definitely approaching some, some value, doesn't it? Yeah, it's probably getting something like that, huh? Looks like it's going down a little bit, huh? And we could keep going and going, but it's definitely approaching some value. It's getting there pretty. I mean, look how accurate that's getting, though. Out to a whole bunch of decimals now. When, when did, at what place does it start to change? We got 22. I mean, it's way out there. It's like three places out is, is where you is only where you start to see the decimals change when I increase the numbers of, of trapezoids. Okay, we we can easily find out what the actual area is on our, on our calculator too if we want it. I wonder if it tells us right here. Nope. OK, 
Okay, let's, let's shift gears. Let's try something else. Let's try, how about if we try inscribed rectangles? Let's go down here. Let's, let's jump down to n equals 1. One's not very good, no. is it? Okay. If I, now, now here, here's how you can think about the inscribed rectangles. I'm starting with the width being, you know, I'm, I'm cutting up my interval from 0 0.5 up to 2 into as many rectangles as we choose, in this case, 1. And I'm just going to inflate, so that's how many slices I'm making. I'm just going to inflate these rectangles from the bottom until they bump into the curve at some point. Now, because this curve is what we just say in, in math, we say it's monotonically increasing or monotonic increasing. It's always increasing on our interval, right? We know that where are these rectangles always going to bump into the, to the curve as they get inflated and pushed up their slices on the upper left edge, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's horrible. That's 0 0.375 is probably a horrible approximation of area. But as I increase the number of rectangles, well, that's, you know, it's better. It's still pretty bad. But it's getting there, right? It's getting there slowly but surely, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, pretty clearly, the trapezoidal rule is, is more accurate, isn't it? Okay. Well, yeah, it does. Trapezoidal rule is always going to be a much better approximation, though. But let's just see. Let's just see something because it it is a little bit harder to calculate for us, though, right? If I get up here to about twenty-ish, this thing starts to look not too bad, though, right? I mean, we're getting there. And here's the nice thing about this: if I kind of so when we go to something like let's just stop at thirty, how about? If we stop at 30, I get an answer of, somebody write this down, 2.531875. So that's our inscribed area for n equals 30, which means 30, I've, I've cut this thing into 30 little slices and inflated the rectangles from the bottom of each of those 30 slices, right? Okay. Now let's flip this over and try the circumscribed, see what we get. Okay, not good, right? One of them, as expected, isn't very good. And this is sort of a reverse roll. This time we've cut this thing into slices. One, then it'll be two, then it'll be three. And we're going to deflate these from the top until they bump into the curve. And if, if, it's a, if it's a circumscribed area that we're looking for, where we're looking for where this thing bumps into the curve that's monotonically increasing on our interval, where in the rectangle are we always going to bump the curve this time? Mm -hmm. Upper right, agreed? As this thing shrinks down, and that's where it's going to impact the curve and stop deflating, okay? So if we start increasing the number, you know, it's pretty similar, right? Get this thing up to about 30. And by the time you get to 30, Somebody write that number down. Yeah, okay, did we get that one written down? So we had 27, uh, or 2.719375, right? And the other one was 2.5, blah, 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 something like that. Somebody averaged those two for me that wrote them down. 6526. I mean, so it's, that's going to be really close. What's the actual answer? Uh, well, let's find out. 2.625. Is the actual answer? Yeah, and the one that gave us was 2.625. Okay, so pretty darn close. So, so that that's not a bad option. That worked. Whoops, that worked okay. All right. Let's let let's talk about. I mean, we got a bunch of choices. Maybe it's still inconclusive though. It seems like we got a real battle weight being waged here in the calculus world. We got to see if we can come to a resolution on this thing. Let's go back to the arena and see what we can come up with. So what we got here, what we got here is I've just got some random function. We're not going to pin this thing down at all. That that last one was obviously a real function. This one we're just going to call f. 
and, and we're just going to start. We, we're not going to be specific about this at all. We're going to be completely general, and that's a good thing to do in math because then when we're done, we can plug in any numbers as an afterthought that we want to. We're going to go ahead and start. We're going to add up this interval right here. Oops, this one right. Well, anyway, if we're going to add up, I thought it was going to be really tricky. We're going to add up this interval from this point to this point. I don't know why I didn't do that. I thought for sure that would work. Oops, we don't need it. So we're going to add it up from what we're going to call A up to B. So this is the area starting there. So if I were to... I were to kind of draw it in, I'm going to turn around and erase it. Let me see what we're looking at. There's yeah. stuff in there. That's what we're trying to find, that whole area. Okay. Uh, and to do that, we're going to slice this thing up. And just to make things easy to begin with, rectangles are easy to start with, right? Let's just use rectangles. And you could decide inscribed or circumscribed, and maybe we'll do both. I'm going to cut this thing up into how many slices do you suppose? 30. 30, maybe? We got a different suggestion? Like eight, slices. eight slices or less. Uh, we can't decide, so let's just say n. Because then we can, after we're done, we can set n to be whatever we want to. So the number of slices is going to be n. And, and we want to see if we can come up with some kind of an expression that's going to describe this area. And if we can do that, that's pretty good. Once we get that done, we can do a lot with it. So what's that going to look like? n slices. It's nice to know, but we're going to need to know something more than that when we try to calculate the, the areas of these things in terms of the parameters that we've set. We've got to be able to add up a rectangle. And to know a rectangle, we're going to have to know the height and the width, right? So for the width, we're going to do something like this. How about if we say we're going to let this width be of all these slices. I know I didn't draw them perfectly uniformly, but if we take this slice right here, for example, let's call this distance from there to there, delta x, so we can have some kind of a width. But that delta x needs to be determined by those arbitrary parameters that I just gave you. The interval is going to go from x equals a to x equals b. So what's the width of the interval? b minus a. But for example, if this was 2, we started at x equals 2 and ended at x equals 7, you know, it'd be 5 would be the width of the whole thing. Right, so the width is b minus a. Uh, and how many slices did we say? N slices. N slices. So then what's going to be the width of one of these individual intervals that we're going to use to try to approximate this area? So if the b whole width is a minus a minus a minus a. Ah, OK, does that make sense? We're going to take the, the, the width of the whole interval divided by the number of slices should tell us how wide each individual slice is if we slice them uniformly, which we're going to do. So that gives us slices of width delta x equals b minus a over n. Okay, very good. All right, so now let's just take an individual slice here. Let's focus on how about this one, this random one in the middle here, one of these guys. Let's take, I want to do, uh, I'll do this one. Okay, let's do inscribed rectangles the first time. Is that what I want to do? Yeah, I want to do inscribed rectangles. Is it good to do like half of your measurements inscribed and half circumscribed? Does that take an average of it? Yeah, which would be a trapezoid kind of, right? That would be a trapezoid. Yeah. So, so we, can look, we can later look at trapezoids. If I wanted to do... Actually, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do circumscribed first. I'm trying to figure out which would be easiest for me. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be easier for me to do that. So that's the one we're going to try to add up. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to call this the ith interval. And then we could choose i to be any one of our intervals starting at 1 and ending at What is, so 
so that the width is delta x. Any ideas how we could calculate the height of this thing? Okay, so it's going to bump the function. If I'm deflating this guy down this, right, this, this is the slice I'm looking at right here. If I'm going to deflate this thing from the top, it's going to bump into the curve there, right? So that's the point that determines the height of the rectangle, okay? Now, this is just a function. This is f of x, right? And so if I look at that point right there, it's just a point with coordinates. coordinates x, f of x. But what's my x value going to be? This is the tricky part. Okay, what's that x value going to be? If I'm starting at a value of a, x equals a, and the width of each of these intervals is delta x, and I'm going to walk over i intervals when I get here, what do you think? b minus a minus delta x times a. Okay. Something like that, very close. What's what's the what's going to be the x value right there? Zero. Well, a. I we don't know what a is. It could be two, for example, right? If that's if that's a, and delta x is something that we can calculate. It's going to be the width of the whole interval divided by the number of slices. So we'll just call it delta x and assume we we kind of know what that is. We're going to calculate what that is. What's going to be what's going to be the x? value right there at the end of that first slice, or the beginning of the second slice? A plus delta x. A plus delta x, right? Okay, so this guy right here we could say is A plus delta x. What's this one going to be right there? A plus 2 delta ah, A plus 2 delta x, okay? This one's going to be A plus 3 delta x. So I'm going to, every time I take a step, I'm just adding another delta x, right? So what if I if I move out to the ith random? You know, ith is what we're going to call an index variable. And that's probably sounding familiar from last year. Remember doing summation stuff? Kind of using i's with the sigma notation? That's a great way to sum up a whole bunch of things. So we're going to do a little review of that. But don't worry about that for now. i is just keeping track of which one that we're dealing with. If I happen to be on the ith rectangle, that means I've taken i steps to get there. Right? And so wouldn't you agree then that the right edge of the ith rectangle is going to be a plus i delta x. A plus i delta, ah, delta x. So that's the x value right there. Okay? So then what's the height of this thing? plus i delta x, we got it. Because those are all things that we know or can easily calculate from the parameters of this problem that would have to be given to us for it to be a real problem, right? We got to know where the area begins. We got to know where it ends. And we got to know how many intervals we're slicing it up into, right? And obviously, we must know the function or we would be doing the problem, right? So presumably, right? So, so we can get all that stuff. So this point becomes then, if I scoot down, We've got this rectangle we're dealing with, and let's just kind of pull it out of that complicated picture. We've got this rectangle. It's got a height of f of a plus i delta x and a width of delta x, right? And the area is just a product of those two things, then, right? So we could then say that the area of rectangle number i is equal to f of a plus i delta x times delta x. Okay. Now, do you see a way? You know, if we had a small number of rectangles, we could do this whole thing. What I like to call manually. We could go through and just say, okay, if this is if we're starting at two and ending at seven, and we're cutting this thing into say five rectangles then their width is just going to be 7 minus 2, 5, divided by 5 is 1. And we could just go through and say, OK, we know that this height is going to be at f of 3, right? And the width is 1. And we could add all these things up and easily come up with a numerical calculation. Right? And we'll do some of that. We're going to kind of backtrack here. 
in, in the very near future. And I'm going to have you guys actually do some of those manually. But right now, I just want to get to a point where do you see that if we wanted to start doing like what we did in our little applet example, n equals 30, you feel like doing that? Nope. That would be very, very tedious to try to add up individual areas for 30 rectangles. And what if we decide we want to use 1,000? That's nobody. I mean, I don't think anybody in the world wants to do that. Can we come up with a tricky, really cool algorithm for calculating the area that we could use some math tools like maybe a summation to solve? If we can come up with an area that is written in terms of the rectangle number that we're dealing with, and that this is, isn't it? Right? This is the area of the ith rectangle, but as i changes, that's going to change this area formula a little bit. Right? Couldn't we then just ask a, a computer or a calculator or even just ourselves using sigma tricks from last year to add up this area? Right? Okay, let's just say that this function was, for example, let's say our function was f of x equals x squared. Okay, let's take this information and see if we can add this thing up. And this is where we're going to start to move into review. Oh, man. Okay, this is probably a good place to stop. This is now what here's where we're going with this. The next step is we want to see if we can come up with a way if a sub i equals we said f of x equals x squared. And uh, let's set a to equal one and let's set b to equal four, for example. And we'll write n, we'll just let n be random. N is just the number of slices. So we come up with a formula. So we got, we said f of a plus i delta x times delta x. What's our delta x going to be from that calculation? The width of the interval is 3. We got n slices, so delta x is just going to be 3 over n. Okay? So that's delta x. So a sub i equals f of a is 1 plus i times 3 over n would just be 3i over n, right? Times delta x squared, uh, well, that's squared, times 3 over n. If f of x is x squared, what's f of hand? If f of x is x squared, what's f of a? A squared. What's f of b? What's f of hand? Hand squared. So what's f of this junk? That junk squared, right? So then this is going to equal the quantity 1 plus 3i over n squared times 3 over n, right? That's the area of the ith interval. What's the area of the whole thing? It's going to be the sum of all those rectangles from 1 to 30. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So then this is now, we're, I, you can't do that, or you probably can, but you don't probably remember how. But that's what we're going to talk about. The total area is just going to equal that. Okay. Remember that? Okay. And, and we're going to spend days on that. So I just want you to see kind of where we're going with this. Okay.